going to be talking about uh, backyard culture, but it is a bit different. We've got a helicopter spraying out here in the commercial grows. You're not going to have a helicopter, I hope, and you're not going to have tractors. I have tried to talk my wife into the, the necessi necessity for having a tractor in our backyard. I haven't got the okay on that yet, but I'm still working on it. I figured, like, when I'm retired, I can get a tractor, right? Right. <laughs> yeah, that's for Christmas. Somebody said when you retire, you become a master gardener, so maybe I'll be a master gardener. No. <laughs> okay, we, don't get it, we don't need maximum yields. We can't, you know, I mean, we're not in commercial production. So you can kind of, you know, mess up a little bit on the irrigation and fertilizer, but they still have the same requirement, no matter whether you have one tree or 100 acres. Same diseases, insects, and pests in the world. So we have a lot of things to consider. I would say in the backyard situation, the site is the, is the biggest. I mean, one of the biggest. You know, you, there's lots of problems. I mean, you don't want to have a big giant tree shedding leaves under a pool. I, I talked to one guy. He said he raked the leaves out of the pool twice a day, and he still couldn't keep up with it. So they like to shed leaves. And there's a reason for that. We'll get into that in a minute. Uh, of course, varieties, that, it, it has something to do with frost tolerance and some other things here. Planting, watering, training, so we're going to be talking about all these topics of today. Site selection. So let's talk about frost. Okay, half avocados will freeze at about four hours at 29 degrees. So you've got to be careful where you put these. Um, I actually live in a place in Fallbrook that I didn't realize uh, the cold air sort of runs down the hill, gets heavy in the winter, and I live in a low spot, and I can't grow half avocados in my house, I can't grow cherimoy, or mangoes, or guavas, or anything, all the things I want to grow, I can't grow. I'm trying to get my wife to move, she said, no, we raised the kids here, and blah, blah, blah. <laughs> Fuerte fruit uh, will take a little colder down around, we think, 26, maybe 27, 26, roughly, something like that. And then if you really in a cold spot like I have, you grow the Mexican type. We have, we have three races of avocado. The Mexican race is most cold tolerant, and they, they're not a commercial variety because they have a very thin skin, and they won't ship. They won't, uh, we can't pack them very well. They have pretty good flavor, but they're, and they're usually pretty small, but they'll take it down to around 24. And I do have a Mexico at my house. <clears throat> they don't like clay soil. They like good drainage. People who have clay soil always seem to have problems with these, unless they do some mounding. And uh, I'll show you some mounding in a minute. And what we do, we just build a, we build a big giant mound and plant the top of the mound. As simple as that. And over the years, we keep adding to the side of the mound with some mulch, some soil, um, keep expanding a little bit. They love that. They love <laughs> mounding. And you can keep the leaf mulch on the ground. And I, I've told this story a lot. Maybe you've heard this before, but we had a couple from New Hampshire move into Fallbrook. They bought a little two-acre grove. They spent a, a, at least a month raking up all the leaves and bagging the leaves. And put them out along the street for the waste guys to pick up. And then it, somehow they got my number and they called me, what do we do next, Dr. Bender? Put all the leaves back. <laughs> Oh, that was so funny. I had such a laugh over that. <laughs> but they, they have a very shallow root system. The feeder roots are right there, underneath the soil, underneath the leaf mulch. And when you take the leaves away, they go into stress. They, they get real dry, and they just don't adjust their root system very well. Because that's how they evolved down in Guatemala and southern Mexico in the rainforest. And they had shallow roots to capture all the nutrients. From their own leaves and other leaves blowing in, bird poop and all that stuff, they were just, that's how they designed They moved the trees up to California, and they're still doing it. And that's why you would never, ever want to rototill under a tree either. You can cut all the roots off, and that's not a good thing. Keep the tree away from, the, from pools and houses. Well, houses, a lot of people have them near the house. If you're, it's okay if you keep them pruned, but if you're going to let them go up to their natural 35 or 40 foot tall, and then you decide, well, maybe it's getting a little scary, that tree might fall over on the house or whatever, and then you bring in somebody to, to cut that tree down, it will cost you above $1,000 to do that because they have to tree climb and keep, keep cut the branches down lower. 
Whereas in a commercial grill, we go out there with a chainsaw and cut it down and it costs maybe $25 to cut the tree down. So it's a big difference. They grow tall. Uh, I have this along. This is my driveway is over here somewhere, and this is my neighbor. And this is my lemon trees, and they're over in his area, his territory. So here the property line is right along here. And at first he came over and complained that my lemon trees were encroaching on his property. So I said, well, just go ahead. You can have half the lemons on my trees. That's okay. So I'll water them. I'll take care of them. You just pick them. Okay. So that worked out fine. Now he's happy with me. <laughs> then one day, they had a big family party. His mother-in-law was over in my driveway picking my side of the lemons. <laughs> so we do have some problems. <laughs> we also have some issues with Toxicity, uh, this, this tree all, the, all died back on that side, and all the plants along here were dead. And we were, what the heck was going on? Half the plants were dying. We looked over the fence, which this guy had never done. He never even looked over the fence. The neighbor has stored all his pool chemicals over here. Oh. I guess he had some spills. He ran under the fence, and really, there you go. Now, we don't see that in the commercial grows usually, although. We do have fertilizer tanks for liquid injection into the irrigation system. And if something happens to the tank and that leaks out, it will kill the trees. So they're pretty sensitive to chemicals. Okay, now we have three races of avocado. We have the Mexican race, Guatemalan, and West Indian. And then, like I said, the Mexicans are thin-skinned, small fruit, um, really not a commercial variety. We can't ship them. Guatemalans, on the other hand, are very thick skinned, tough. Some are so thick you can't even push them. And you have to, they used to take the stem off and put a toothpick down the center to see if it was soft enough to eat. You couldn't tell from the outside. So we got lucky and found some natural hybrids of these two. Uh, good flavors, you know, thin, rather thick but not too thick. And they have a long harvest season. And, uh, we have Pass and Fuerte are the most, probably the most uh, famous, most commercial ones. Now, Fuerte started out as a big commercial variety back in the 1930s. And we still see those trees along the coast in some backyards and then uh, in uh, Lucadia, Encinitas, all those areas. Every, every once in a while I see a big Fuerte in the backyard. The other race, the West Indians, are the ones we grow in the tropics, and those are a big, Fruit usually, water, they're more watery. They don't have the oil content that ours do. And the people in Florida are very unhappy with us because they have an uh, industry of these south of Miami and uh, they have short seasons. Each variety has about a two week season. So they have early, mid, and late seasons. And what they've done, they've selected these varieties they kind of paste them all together to make an industry. So then they ship along the East Coast. Every once in a while they ship out to California. I don't know why. <laughs> and and they, we saw it in Fallbrook at the Albertsons one time. I saw this display. Uh, Low-calorie low avocado. Oh. <laughs> Weight loss avocado. Like, what in the world is this? And there were, there were these West Indians from Florida. I, they pull the produce, produce and they, this is very insulting. This is, <laughs> this is the center of avocado production. You have to so the people in Florida are happy with their West Indian varieties because they've never tasted really fine California grown avocados. Well, I don't know about that, but that's, <laughs> that's all they can grow. <laughs> and you'll find these in the truck. Now, they're big fruit. And they'll, every once in a while, drop. And if you get hit on the head with one of these, it'll really knock you. Really knock you. Something all the master gardeners should realize, we have A and B flower types. Okay, so then we have A flower types. Now, now, we know these trees have about a million flowers. But now, we know they have a million flowers because we have a grad student that went out and counted them. <laughs> each, each flower opens and closes and drops. There's another one, opens and closes and drops. If they don't set, they'll drop. So. Of course, the, the grad student came back with, and said, okay, this one had around a million flowers, and he had the exact number. And he's working, I believe, for Dr. Lovett. 
Dr. Levitt said, well, that's fine, but we need replications of this before they can publish this. So he, had to, he, had, he had to do a lot more. Because for a master's degree, poor guy, I think he really earned his degree. <laughs> Did he get his doctorate for that? <laughs> no. Okay, so uh, now this type will open as a female in the morning, closes overnight, and it opens as a male in the afternoon of the second day. And like I said, if it doesn't set, that, that flower will drop. This is just the opposite. It opens as a female in the afternoon, closes overnight, and opens as a male in the morning of the second day. So if you have a A and a B tree right next to each other, in the morning, one will be female, one will be male. In the afternoon, it'll be just the opposite. One will be male and one will be female. So theoretically, if the bee can take the pollen from the male to the female, over there, they will get set and get fruit set, fertilization and fruit set. Okay, so if all works good. Now that's at a mild temperature during the spring. If the temperatures get up, if it's too cold, say, or it's too hot, we can get off. And I think if and during the cold temperatures, I think we sometimes we have the female of the A opening in the afternoon, then closing, and somehow it opens the male early in the morning or the, 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 before the dark, before it gets light, before the bees are out. So mm -hmm. that's one of the reasons why we get off on our fruit set. You know, we get, we start, we get a low, low yield that year, then sometimes we'll get a higher yield the next year. So sometimes we get on and off. If we have nice mild temperatures, that works just like this. And, and you said each individual flower will only open twice, once as a male, once as a female, and then drop the stuff yeah. if it doesn't fall in Each flower. individual flower opens once as a female, then once as a male, and drops. Mm -hmm. So that's why, it's one of the reasons why the, the tree has so many flowers, a million flowers. We're happy. We get a good yield of 200 of those flowers set. Yeah. We get 100 pounds of fruit. That's a good yield. So, very inefficient tree. That tells you it hasn't been around and probably in breeding for thousands, I mean, in, in selection by, by humans for thousands of years like the citrus has, you know. So, uh, it's a young, it's a young uh, agricultural crop, basically. Excuse me? So, this is on one tree, male and female flowers on one tree. Mm -hmm. It's not different tree types, right? Same flower. Each flower is male. Each, Each flower is male and female. Okay. Each, yeah, in the morning, every single flower will be female. Oh, okay. okay. And then in the afternoon, every single flower will be male. Wow, and every single, both parts okay. are on the same yeah. tree. Yes. Okay. Here's what they look like. Here's a female. Right in the center is the stigma. That's the female. That's the receptive part. That's that's sticky. Waiting for some pollen to come along. Okay, but the males aren't interested. They're all laying down here. <laughs> this is male. All the males are sticking up, really interested. Okay, but the female has lost the interest, and has, the sticky part's all dried up, and it's not not receiving pollen. So the 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 tree, the tree has designed this, you know, for cross pollination. So they didn't want to pollinate they didn't want pollination within the same tree. They wanted to bring some, some pollen to, you know, just improve the genetics and you know, the whole operation. Does this sound familiar? Sounds <laughs> 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 pretty familiar to me. Gary, Gary on the on the um, trees that are considered self fertile. Um, some you know some of the varieties will have fruit even if they don't have a pollinator. Absolutely. How does that work? Good point. Okay, so we're still getting fruit. Even if you have 100 acres of past, which is an A flower type, you'll still get a lot of fruit. Why, why is that? Most of, it, most of that takes place at noon. During a relatively short period when we still have a crossover, when we have females beginning to close, males beginning to open, we have enough crossover to make a crop. We can improve that by having some cross-pollinator trees in there, but we don't have a market for those. That's, it used to be, um, when, the, when the groves were set up, they had the hass higher on the hill where it was warmer, and then they had the bacons and zutanos and fuertes lower on the hill where it was colder. So the bees would go back and forth. That worked out pretty good. Then we lost our market for all our, our bee flower types, because they were winter varieties, Chile came in with fruit during the winter with their hats. So we only have hats in front of the consumer year-round, 
and but we don't have any room in the market for these other types, right? So that's what happened. And, and our yields have gone down. You know, have gone down. Here's our eight flower varieties. Hass, which is the most common one, that that we have probably 95% of the fruit in the in the world, commercial fruit in the world, is is Hass. Very good variety. Has a long harvest season. We can harvest anywhere from January through August in San Diego. So we can pick when we want to. And then after it gets into August, it starts to lose the flavors and gets a little rancid taste, and, and that's about it. Uh, reed is a definitely a summer fruit, July, um, August, September. Very good tasting fruit. You know, reed's a good fruit. Actually, a good fruit, a good tree for the backyard. It seems to set. Pretty good by itself. Uh, then, of course, lamb has, I'll talk about that in a minute. Tinkerton, Harvest, and Holiday, these are just some new varieties. And then our bee flower, bacon, zutano, and fuerte, and some new ones. Well, Nabel's not new, but and then Surprise is a new one. Now, this one, that one, and this one came out of the UCR's breeding project relatively <laughs> lately, and also lamb has. And, and this all originated from a it's about 10,000 seedlings that were crossed and selected or whatever here at UCR, and they were looking for a place to grow them out. Well, the, a grower in Carpent, Carpenteria, it was a Camarillo, volunteered to take all 10,000, plant them out, irrigate them, fertilize them, grow them up, and then people from UCR would go up there, and they'd go through and they'd rate each one. I think Dr. Burke said they had 51 characters they were looking for in every single tree. The tree growth, size, fruit, all everything. And they selected about, I think about nine or ten of those that looked interesting. And they they named them. One was Lamb Hass, and, uh, and then one was surprised that they're looking for some bee flower types right here also. They're looking for high yielding, so Lamb Hass came in as a very high yielding one. Surprise came in as a bee flower with black skin. They thought maybe it could cross-pollinate the uh, Hass, and what they were looking for was something they could have, uh, let's say, a flower Hass and a B flower Hass. That's the goal. That's the, that's the supreme goal of this whole thing. Mm -hmm. Where they could have every other row with a different flower type, but say the same fruit, right? Hass. So Surprise came the closest. It had a black skin, uh, B flower. But I mean, you could tell it wasn't didn't have quite have the same season and didn't didn't quite look like a has. We were thought we could fool a consumer, but we can't. <laughs> Does the reed? What temperature will reed go to? What temperature will it go to? Freezing. Oh, freeze. Yeah. Well, it's about the same as has. Is it? Yeah, it's pretty sensitive. Twenty nine. Okay, so the idea was could we approve fruit set in a single tree by in the back of our, by doing a double graft? Let's say take a has and graft. You bacon it. Um, there was a large trial set up in Fallbrook when I started by Dr. Berg, and they had a they had all the different ones that grafted into Hass, and it was they were about ready to get to their first harvest, and this is going to be really good. So they had a, a Zutano grafted into some, Fuertes grafted into some, Bacon grafted into some, and they had the controls that weren't grafted, uh, and, and so but the grower took the whole lot out, put in a parking lot for his RVs. And, and, uh, some, some animals they wanted to put in. And, uh, I'm not sure he even told the university. I mean, that's just a, an example of some of the failures we've had from some of our trials. We've had everything you can think of go wrong. So I should write a book on this. There's our hass uh, on, on the tree. Pretty good yield here. You, you get inside. Nice looking fruit, and they'll be green on the tree. And then as you harvest, it'll gradually turn black. And usually that's that's as it's ripening, and it'll usually turn soft at the same time. And so you know you know when to uh, when to eat it. There's a hass here with black black skin. Good size. They like about eight ounce fruit. That's what we have normally in the store. Um, it's about the right size probably for salads and things. Uh, we have we can produce much larger fruit. We've got other varieties that are much larger, but the produce managers don't think they think that the consumer doesn't like that. They don't like large fruit. We can easily supply large fruit, but we just don't. 
But that's only because the consumer hasn't been educated that you cut it in half, take the seed out, and take the cut half you're not eating that day and slap it on a plate. Uh, absolutely. Because a lot of consumers didn't grow up here and they, they cut it in half and it oxidizes and they get turned off. Well, true, true enough that. And the other thing, <laughs> the other thing about that, Carol, is you go in a store, you see one variety of apple pie. You see half and that's it. How many varieties of apples do you see? Oh, wow. so, for apples, but not, not, not for avocado, which is very important. So we have a black peel here, and the theory I have is that produce managers, when you when you push it with your thumb or your fingers uh, to see if it's soft for tonight, on the fuertes and the green skins, you'll leave a fingerprint. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And they don't like that. I mean, it doesn't look all that great to have fingerprints on your fruit, right? <laughs> so, but you can't see fingerprints in here. And you can have all kinds of fingerprints, you just won't see it. So they like that. Okay, so we were looking for things that would set higher. Kind of hard for you to see on this slide, I'm afraid, with the light in here. But there's very heavy yield fruit set inside the tree. Lamb has was we're looking for something that would set more and put more into fruit, less into branches and twigs and all the other stuff. We, we still have to have leaves, of course, for, for photosynthesis, but we don't need all this wood. So... And, and why is it named lamb pass? It doesn't taste like lamb. <laughs> yeah, I keep getting that call. What, what about this? No, it was named after Bob Lamb, who he was the guy in Camarillo who donated the land for the uh, for, for growing all these varieties. Okay, so he really helped us out. So they thought they should honor him. Kind of unfortunate. And of course, we have bacon avocado thing. People think that's that tastes like bacon. And, um, that was the name after Jim Bacon, who had he actually bred that in his backyard in Buena Park. So a lot of these were local fruit bred here. Reed came out of a farm in Carlsbad back in the nineteen fact nineteen forty eight, I believe that was sort of. Land has is uh, here. Uh, it's a black skin, which they were looking for high yield. Has a different harvest season though. We're a little late later, so this would be a July, August, September fruit, um, and has a flat shoulder. So it's a little bit different than half. See, see the difference? There's half. There's lamb half. So, I mean, you know, we, we, the consumer maybe can be fooled, but of course we can't. Educated, not fooled. Late, late season. July, that's been on the tree for a year and a half, right? right? As opposed to like a Zutano has been on a tree less than a year. That's right. So yeah, let's, let's say those, this fruit will set in, let's say, spring of 2014, be harvested in the summer of 2015. Lamb mm house? -hmm. Yeah, past lamb house. Now, now the more Mexican types, uh, like uh, the Zutano maybe, and Bacon, they're, they're shorter, they have a shorter, they have more Mexican genes in them than, 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 than the Guatemalan genes. These guys have more Guatemalan genes in them than Mexican genes. So they're a little longer in the tree. So this was one of the nine winners out of the 10,000 plants that were planted? Yes. Just to make a point, when people call us and say, can I plant an avocado tree from a pit in my backyard, is an example of why they shouldn't do that. Because their odds are not in their favor. Well, I mean, Nine you should never out. plant with an un ungrafted seed unless you, exactly, okay, I get what you're saying. Because we have people call on the hotline and they want to stick an avocado in their garden yeah. and they think they're going to produce great seed. You have 10 chances out of 10,000 to have something come out. No, no, no. What out of 1,000? What out of 1,000? Good stuff. Yeah? Uh, you said Haas, the melon Haas, you can harvest between June and August. Did you uh, did you lose some January. for the next year? Jan January. What? The, the, the next year leave uh, wouldn't be less if you leave it late yes. in August. Yes, absolutely correct. Yes, if we if we wait and pick all our fruit in August, we're going to have it really cuts down the fruit set for next year. Because I see they are already flowering now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, this is a weird year. I mean, they're flowering, yeah. they're flowering early. Uh, normally, I mean, we often do get early flowering, but we don't get fruit set usually till about April, mid-April. The, the grove I've been working in, Valley Center, I would say about halfway, halfway through the bloom is about April 15th in that particular grove. And that's when I start to see the fruit set come up. And part of that reason is that's when the bees become more active. It's warmer for the bees, they're out looking. 
Um, and usually, you know, earlier in the year it's too cold. Now the bees are definitely out working right now. They're in flower. We're going to have a very early fruit set. So, you know, who knows what's going to happen. This will be really interesting. We, we may actually may get past harvested from California starting in November this year. And, and sometimes that happens, but usually. Usually it's, they're not mature. There's a maturity level they have to reach. And the state is, the state is monitoring this. They have a state inspector going around to the packing houses. They take different sized fruit and they check them out. It used to be 8% oil content. Now I think it's about 21% dry matter content. So what they do, they take a slice, of, take a slice of the flesh, weigh it, and then they dry it out in the microwave, completely dry, weigh it again. It has to reach that 21% level before the state will say this is a mature fruit. So it will be listed on the listed on the California Avocado Commission website when each variety is ready to go. Yeah, so at that time you can actually harvest, you don't affect the next year crop. Well, okay, there was some research done in Australia, and I'll put it into our terms. A uh, third of the crop have, had to be harvested before April uh, to reduce the crop size in order not to affect the, the, the next year's crop. If you let wait, let, let, harvest everything after April, then you're affecting next year's crop. Mm -hmm. Okay, reed is uh, more like a big round cannonball, kind of hard to see in this here, but it's a, it's a big round fruit, uh, wonderful flavor. July, August, and September now will be, be a, the A flower type, and it's a green skin. And uh, I have to tell you a story about what happened to my wife. I, we were going, my, one of my sons lives in Seattle, and uh, a grower had given me a bunch of reeds. So that's how I'd take them up to, to Joel, my son. And, so I didn't have room in my suitcase, but my wife did. So I packed a, a, her suitcase full of reeds. Oh, didn't tell her, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> and so I went through the scanner at the, at the airport, and it looked like a bunch of bombs. You know? oh. <laughs> it was right after the big terrorism thing. And, and they called her name out over the microphone. Oh, Patricia Bender, Steve, please step forward for personal inspection or something like that. Uh, you, should, you know, my wife is very shy and bashful, and she was mortified. <laughs> so yeah, she's, she's still mad at me, but she's got But I thought it was hilarious. She's mad at that too. She's mad at that. Okay, so this is a fuerte and uh, green skin. Uh, that's, the, that's the size of it. It's it's a very good flavor. A lot of us think that's still the best flavored avocado we ever come up with. If you could have one of these in the backyard, that would be great. And if you could have that next to a house, uh, it's not. The, we don't think it's actually the best cross pollinator. We think Zutano and Bacon are probably better, but this is sure a good flavor.